We'll go ahead and uh, jump in. Thank you for that uh, intro, Catherine. And uh, I just want to reiterate, yes, it is being recorded. All the slides and code, all that stuff is either up online already or will be up online. If you have any issues, um, you know, don't worry about it because you'll be able to get back to the recording. So uh, don't worry about missing stuff. Um, another disclaimer. So um, I am actually teaching uh, a uh, half-day HTML5 JavaScript workshop right now. We're in the middle of that, and I've got a bunch of attendees here in person. Um, so this is part, this webcast is part of a large event. And uh, I understand from some estimates that we may have um, a couple thousand people connecting online, um, which I think is awesome. So I hope that uh, this inspires you with HTML5 and JavaScript and, and all the great stuff that's going on there. Um, so. Let us know if there's any questions that you have. You can see there my um, contact information on Getify on Twitter. Also, getify.me, that website, has every possible contact you can imagine, my emails and uh, chats and all that stuff. Uh, please don't blow up my chat while I'm doing this webcast. But anyway, um, if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to, to reach out. So uh, we're going to jump right into some really heavy uh, stuff with JavaScript. Uh, so if you're frightened by code, um, you know, sit by somebody close so that, uh, so that you're not too scared because we're going to go into a lot of code today. And um, the purpose of this is to uh, reveal some of, the, um, some of the most advanced topics that we covered in the HTML5 cookbook. Let me see if I can get that slide to advance. There we go. The HTML5 cookbook, um, which just came out back uh, right after Thanksgiving, myself and Christopher Schmidt, who's actually here in person with me, uh, were the co-authors. We also had a number of um, fantastic uh, community members that contributed chapters for this book. Uh, so we're very excited about that book. It is on sale today. O'Reilly's got a 50% off of that. And uh, so make sure to pick up a copy of that. Um, we are going to be dealing with most of the APIs that are talked about in the advanced JavaScript chapter, the last chapter of this book and then going even a little beyond that. Um, so anything you hear today that you want to jump back into, the book is a great resource for that. So um, the premise of today's talk will be, will be to explore these advanced HTML5 JavaScript APIs in the context of weaving them together to build a game. And this game I call We Puzzle It. It is a, an online multiplayer game. Yes, it will be live and yes, it will be playable, but I'm not going to do that until towards the end of my talk because I don't want you guys to leave and ignore my talk and get addicted to playing the game. <laughs> so we will um, we'll show off that game a little while later, um, but we're going to talk about the code and see some screenshots from that. Uh, this is not intended at all to be a um, a whiz-bang pretty game. This is a game that's showing off this bare-bones functionality in HTML5 and JavaScript. Um, so if anybody out there is a designer and wants to help me make a pretty design for it, please, please feel free to speak up. All the code that we're going to be talking about today is available at this URL. Uh, the longer URL works, but really the only part that you actually need is the part that's bold and bigger, 5bl.geti.fi. That will take you to the GitHub repo for WePuzzle It. And uh, so you can follow along in that code. We've got all the code in the slides today, though. So uh, you can stick to the slides and then check out the code later. And uh, without any further ado, we're just going to go ahead and jump into the first, um, first set of APIs. So the first one that we're going to talk about is Canvas. Um, and make sure if you're having any trouble um, reading the fonts in these um, code views, you can make sure to maximize your slide view or whatever. Uh, we're going to talk about Canvas, and we're going to look at several different snippets of code and how I use Canvas in this uh, multiplayer game. So before we do that, though, let me just say, um, when I said it's, it's a multiplayer game, uh, the concept of the game is that people upload a picture. The game slices up that picture into a whole bunch of tile puzzle pieces, mixes them up, and then everybody collaborates as quickly as possible to resolve the puzzle, and you get scored points based upon how quickly you do so and, and how many people are in the room and so forth. Uh, so uh, it is user-generated content, so I don't take any credit or uh, blame for what people may or may not upload to the game. Uh, let's just keep that clear. All right, Canvas. Um, so Canvas is actually, um, it, it a little bit predates what we would what we would officially call HTML5 these days, um, but it really is sort of the hallmark element that ushered in a new realm of what JavaScript is capable of 
in HTML5. It gives us a, a canvas, if you will, a blank slate that we can draw and we can draw using vector commands and then render those to pixels. And um, so very much like you would pop open Photoshop and draw a graphic, you can do so directly inside of a canvas element using commands. So we'll take a look at this first piece of code and you can see um, uh, starting about line 307 in this code, you can see I create a canvas element, I give it an ID attribute, and then I um, grab the context from that. And by the way, I'm using jQuery simply because it makes the code um, smaller and easier to see on these slides. There's no requirement at all that jQuery be used with HTML5. Uh, there's many others that you can choose. It was just my flavor of choice. Um, and it makes the code in, in a lot of places smaller and, and easier to demonstrate. Uh, but you can see I created a canvas element and I get its 2D context. And that context is what we need to issue all of the drawing commands that we're going to work with. So um, then I, I give it an attribute. I set the width and the height of the canvas. And then I do a curious thing because I also then set the CSS width and the CSS height. And this is probably one of the most common points of confusion about the Canvas API. The Canvas element has both physical dimensions and virtual dimensions. The physical dimensions are how it's rendered and that's controlled by CSS. The virtual dimensions are basically how big is the um, size of the pixel grid that you are allowed to draw into. So you can actually have those two not be the same and you can achieve various different scaling effects and things like that. Most of the time, when people do that, it's by accident. Um, so most of the time, you want to set them to the same thing. Um, but in some cases, you can set them separately. In our case, I'm setting them to the same to make sure that both my virtual and physical dimensions are the same. Um, we'll get into context.save here in just a moment, but you can see that I set up the canvas, and then a little bit later in this function, starting at, two, uh, let's see, 298 function draw grid, you can see that I'm using the context variable to perform some drawing commands. In this case, I actually want to draw a grid. We'll see a picture in a moment, but I want to draw a grid, some grid lines, and I want to use those lines in a very specific way, and I could have used the line to command, and in fact, when I first wrote this code, that's what I use, but I actually want to use these lines as a mask. Um, what that means is you lay down something in a canvas uh, and you say, any drawing commands that happen, I only want them to affect inside of the mask. So for instance, you may draw a circle and then use that as your clipping mask and then draw a bunch of squiggly lines all over the page. Only that which shows up with inside of your circle mask will actually be visible. So in this case, I want a grid of lines, horizontal and vertical lines, to be my mask. And uh, the unfortunate part is that lines themselves can't be used as masks. So I simply do a one pixel wide, or in this case, two pixel wide, um, rectangle to simulate the line and that can be used as a mask. But you can see here I, I'm, I'm simply uh, iterating over the x-axis and then the y-axis and I'm drawing my lines accordingly using the rect command. And that takes an xy as the top left corner and then a width and a height for your line. Okay. Let's see some more examples how we use Canvas. Following further down in the function you can see there is where we had that context save. Now, what we're going to call begin path. It essentially says to, so we're going to do a bunch of different things, uh, drawing commands, vector drawing commands like lines and arcs and directs and other things like that. We want you to consider all of those together as a single operation when we either do a clip or we render it with stroke or fill. So from begin path to the next drawing command uh, that render, or the rendering command, all of the operations that you do in between will be considered one. So we begin the path before calling draw grid, then we draw it, and then we tell what then we tell Canvas that what we just drew, we want to treat that as a clipping mask. That's one context.clip on line 320. Now the next thing I do is I'm drawing an image onto the canvas canvas and I'm using the function called draw image. So I'm getting from the preview image, which we'll see later is, is what you've uploaded as an image. I'm going to go ahead and draw that onto the canvas that was just clipped. That will have the effect of drawing only the parts that were inside of those lines of the grid. Next thing I do is set the global composite. This is saying that when I do another drawing command on top of existing drawings, how do I want those pixels to be combined? And in this case, I want them to actually lighten themselves up. So if the same color is drawn twice, I want it to simply lighten that color by half. So I use the global composite operation lighter, set the global alpha, and then, and we'll see in the next one, I simply draw 
the image a second time, again using the clip. And what I have done is I've achieved the effect that only where those grid lines happen, the pixels that are from our underlying image will actually show up as lighter color. So uh, that's how we're using Canvas. Of course, there's a lot other to the API, but those are a couple of um, advanced functions there. And let's take a look at what that, um, oh, actually, we're gonna we'll look at one more piece of code and then we'll look. Okay, so here I'm doing some, um, uh, this is uh, another place in our code where we're actually drawing the image into the Canvas so that we can grab it. So here I've got an image element and then I am grabbing the data from and putting it into my canvas. And then I do the reverse. On line 412, I get the canvas element, the underlying element, and I ask for its data URL, and I pass it a type, in this case, maybe JPEG or something. And uh, I get a data URL, and then I can set that data URL directly into an image's source attribute. So you see, on, uh, starting on line 415, I create an image, I set up a load function for it to uh, listen to when that data URL finishes loading into it. And then that's when we call that build preview grid on top of it. So this was uh, loading a data, data from a canvas into an image, and then we grab it back out of that image, do some manipulation on it, and put it right back. That's basically what's happening. So we take a look at, um, okay, I guess we had one more, <laughs> sorry, we had one more uh, slide of code before we look at the image. Uh, another way that I'm using um, the, so, so this is the bottom of that function, and this is where we set on line 440, you can see we set the source to that new data URL that we just um, put, we call, give it its width and height, and then we append it to a container. So now what we've done is drawn um, the image from the canvas into an image element, and that way we'll be able to display that image element and then overlay it with our grid canvas. This is an example where I've uploaded a clown image, and what you can see is I didn't actually draw the lines. What I did was simply lighten the color of the image where the grid lines were. That was using that global composite operation, and the way I did that was to draw the image twice using global composite image operation lighten or lighter, and that's what gives us that effect. Kind of a scary looking clown. All right, so another part in the in the code that we use Canvas is to slice up the image into the tiles. I could have used server-side processing to process an image, but since this is HTML5 and it's capable of doing so, I do all the slicing browser-side inside of the Line 257, we simply loop through the dimensions of our canvas element, and we draw only part of that image into another canvas. So we're essentially taking square tile snapshots from our main image into a separate canvas element. The reason we do that is we grab that into a separate canvas element using context.draw image, and then we turn right back around and we call to data URL to grab the data URL just for that image. So this is a very simple, if not entirely efficient, but very simple way that we use HTML5's canvas element to do the slicing up of our image into a bunch of smaller square images, each of which is its own image now in terms of data URL. So each one can be loaded into its own image element. And then we'll take a look now in this next slide. This is slide 12, um, for those of you who are following along. Um, slide 12 shows us uh, the clown image in a smaller preview, the grid where we're going to place our game pieces, and then all the game pieces as individual image elements scrambled up. Next, we're going to talk about app cache. So I'm going to go on a, a small little um, uh, side note on app cache, kind of give my own opinion of it. Um, app cache is designed to provide more capable functionality for offline, especially when we're talking about mobile apps. The idea is that you tell the browser using app cache that you want it to aggressively cache all of the elements of your page, all your CSS and your images and so forth, specifically for the purpose of making them available to the app when it happens to be on a device that's offline. 
So if somebody were using a local app and they were local functionality, like for instance, slicing up the Canvas images where we don't need a server, um, it would be able to continue to work even if that person were offline. Um, it has the unfortunate side effect of being really, really aggressive at caching. And when I say really, really aggressive, most people are familiar with the idea that you can do a shift reload or you can even clear your browser cache and force the browser to reload the elements. Um, with app cache, that's not true. <laughs> Unfortunately, with app cache, you have to be a little bit more careful about how you force the browser um, to make sure that you want it to download new elements when you change something about your site. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. But to start out with, the way you uh, use app cache is you create a cache manifest file. The file name doesn't matter, but the file type is important. You need to make sure it's uh, the correct cache manifest file type. And here you can see that we simply list our resources. Um, I have a comment at the top that says cache version 13. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then I have a cache section that lists all the resources that I want it to proactively cache. We have a network section that tells me which URLs I may be making AJAX calls to or, or network-based calls to both AJAX and Socket. In this case, I use STAR because this entire app is online capable and there really wouldn't be much fallback functionality. But here, if you do not list something in the network section, your app will not be able to communicate with it on the network. So if you have AJAX endpoints, you must make sure that they're all listed here and you can use wildcards. And finally, the fallback section, again, in this case, it's just a placeholder. I would have an offline.html file that said, uh, you have to be online to play this game, but uh, we can have a fallback. And that's what the cache manifest file looks like. Continuing on to slide 14, this is how we activate that app cache in our markup. If you look at line two, uh, the rest of this markup is just standard markup from the game, but line two is where you would specifically put manifest attribute and you give it a URL to your cache manifest file. In this case, I call it cache-manifest.txt. When you do that, that's enough to tell the browser, hey, kick in this special caching behavior, make sure that you make all those uh, items available um, to be cached and aggressively do so that even if we're in an offline or an empty cache scenario, we make sure that they're still able to load the app, which in some cases is really helpful and again, in other cases can be difficult. For instance, if you're in a long running application, something like Gmail, and you push out a code update that relies upon new code that's on your server, and you wanna make sure that people using the old code get updated as soon as possible, that's actually really difficult to do with AppCache, which brings us to why AppCache has a JavaScript API. If it didn't have an API, I probably wouldn't be talking about it. Um, in this case, the JavaScript API for AppCache allows us to sort of forcibly tell the browser, there's an update ready, let's go ahead and make sure we get that update. But until the browser knows that there is an update, and there's only one way to do that, and that is to change the cache manifest file, which is why I had that comment a couple of slides ago up at the top with a version. Every time you change one of those resources that is cached, you have to change that file. It is sufficient to change a comment in that file, which is where most people have come up with the best practice of using version and comment to do so. But you must make sure that you change that or the user is not gonna get the benefit of those new things. So in the Gmail scenario, we've changed our app cache comment and the browser is now capable of doing so. The problem is that Somebody, even if somebody were to refresh their page and the browser were to say, hey, there's a new cache manifest file, let me re-download all those resources. It has the behavior uh, for performance reasons that even though it knows upon that page refresh that there, are new, that there are new versions of the resources, it will continue to use the old versions for one more page load. So a user actually would have to do two page refreshes to get the benefit of the new code. That's kind of an unfortunate side effect of how this um, functionality works. So this JavaScript that we kick in is designed to help um, kind of fix that. First, we have the cache.update. That basically tells the browser, instead of requiring a page load to check, go ahead and proactively check that manifest file and see if it's changed. If the browser sees that the manifest file has indeed changed and it fires the update ready event, then what we do is we make sure that we're in the update ready state and then in this case, I'm simply saying, um, let's go ahead and ask the user if it's okay to refresh the browser page for them. 
because we have already downloaded the update, a single refresh will use the new data. So location.reload would use the new resources. That's because we proactively did it before a page load. In this particular scenario, if I were using app cache on the app, I would make sure to um, call this like on a 20 or 30 minute background interval or something of that nature. Um, and if I were doing so in an automatic nature like that, I would want to make sure to ask the user first before I just proactively refresh their page. And that's the reason for the confirm question there. If instead you hook this functionality up to maybe a manual refresh button inside of your app um, that users were allowed to press themselves, the user would have already expressed the intent to update the app cache and there'd be no need to request again to ask them. That's simply a, a question of best practice. Don't, don't just refresh the page while they're in the middle of typing something, for instance. Okay, moving on to storage. We have two APIs that have been around. Again, this is another example. These APIs were around before we were really officially calling things HTML5, um, but they definitely um, belong in the category as far as I'm concerned of what, what HTML5 brings to the table. So we have local storage and session storage. These two APIs are exactly the same. The only difference between these two APIs other than the name is the functionality of how long they store things. Session storage is, unsurprisingly, just for that current browser tab session. And what that means is as soon as that tab closes or as soon as that browser window closes, that session will die, and therefore any storage that you had associated with that session would go away. This is actually a good thing. In most cases, you want to maybe expire somebody's active login session, and you would use session storage perhaps to do that. This is sort of an analog to what we had in the cookie days because there are cookies that you can make be session-only cookies or more persistent cookies. Local storage then is a fully persistent cache and it will stay until you delete it programmatically using the API or until the user manually goes in and says clear out the app data associated with the site. So they even have to go further than just clearing out their cache. They have to specifically clear out the data. But the APIs otherwise are exactly the same. We have get item, set item, and remove item. And uh, there's a couple of other associated behaviors, but those are the main ones that we want to do. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Here, in this case, I have a session ID that I store in session storage. That session ID is something that's generated by my backend server code. And that allows me to know that this person has an active login. This will survive across page refreshes, which is what I want. I want to be able to reconnect a person automatically if they refresh the page, I want to reestablish their socket connection, et cetera. Um, what we have, uh, we, we get the item, see whether or not the session ID is there. We set the item if we need to save it. And then when we want to make sure that we proactively clear out the session, which would happen when you were logging out, then we can forget the session ID by removing the item from session storage. That particular step with sessions is probably not super necessary um, because you can just write over the same session ID again, but for cleanliness sake, we remove that item. Then we move on to save user info, and retrieve user info, and in the next slide we'll see the forget user info. Um, that's where I actually want to store the person's name and email address that they've entered into my login form. I want to remember that for them. Um, so I store that in local storage, and that will persist across page closings and window closings so that when I go back, it will remember my name and email and I can just click the login button. Uh, again, when I click log out, we will forget that user info. So that's the difference that I'm using between local storage and session storage. Here's that um, forget user info we simply call remove item. Okay, uh, let's take a look at what that screenshot looks like, um, slide 18. Here you can see I came to this page. I actually went to another page in my app, and it said it took me to the login page and said you need to log in first, and it helpfully had remembered my name and email. In this particular game, I should mention, uh, there's no passwords or anything. There's no authentication because uh, this is just a demo stuff. So it simply asks you to enter in a name and email address, and if you enter in the same name and email as you did before, you'll get back in with the same account, and only one person can be in the account at a time. So not a lot of security involved or anything like that, but that's not necessary for a demo game. 
All right, next we'll move on to the history API. This is the friendly name for actually a set of behaviors that have been added to several different parts of uh, existing JavaScript, fixing a number of long-term bugs that we had. I'm sure many of you are aware of the bugs, um, especially in browsers like Internet Explorer where people had trouble trying to um, change the page URL without a page refresh, and the only way they could do that is to change the hash, but then in some cases it would create extra browser backward and forward entries and it wouldn't allow them to manage the backward forward history the way they wanted. So we came along and said, let's figure out a better API, let's figure out what we need to fix about those existing APIs rather. Um, to fix that. In this particular app, I'm using sort of a single page app uh, mindset where when you click on a link, instead of doing a full page load, I simply make an AJAX call to grab the content and replace it in the page. This allows me to have a single connected socket and not have to reconnect that socket on each page load. Um, so I'm using this function that I wrote called AJAX link. It's pretty straightforward. It simply attaches to every link in a page and says if this is a link that we want to Ajaxify, uh, cancel out the normal link action and make sure that we call this go to page function um, where we will manually handle asking for the data from the file and loading it in using Ajax. That's pretty standard. Probably a lot of people are familiar with that kind of uh, concept, but here uh, that sets us up for how we'll actually use the History API to make sure that the URL updates in a nice, pretty way. So what will happen when we call this is inside of the go to page function, what will happen is we ask for um, the code using a, a, a jQuery's AJAX function. We're going to load that. If you look on line 113, you see it's loading the page and it's loading a specific div with ID content. Um, but in the next slide, we'll see the body of post injection, which is called on line 115. That's actually where we're going to hook into our history API to make sure that even though we just loaded this new page content, we actually want to update the address bar to make it look like they navigated to a full new page. So if we, load, if we navigated to login.html by loading its content, now we want the address bar to say login.html. And we can do that with the new API. So this is what it would look like. Um, I was on the home page and I navigated to the login page and you can see login.html and yes, I've grayed out the full address of the game because I still don't want you playing and not paying attention to my talk, but we'll get to it, I promise. Uh, so you can see login.html exactly like we would have wanted it to be, but this was still a single page app and that's a, a key piece of functionality that will help us uh, regain control of our URLs instead of all the ugly uh, hashes on the end that uh, we've had for so many years, or so-called hash bangs, uh, as many people in the industry like to complain about. All right, here is the function call for post injection. That's how it's capable of actually updating that. We call, I'm actually using uh, a polyfill for the history API called history.js, and that gives me a proper history object that I can call things on. Um, you can use just the bare underlying functions, but history.js actually makes things really nice and easy. So in this particular case, I have two types of page navigation in the address bar that I want to perform. One is where I want to create a new entry in the backward forward. So I've done a full page load to a different page and I want to do a new entry that would be able to be uh, associated with the backward and forward. To do that, I would use push state. And you can see here I'm calling history.push state. The first two parameters are always ignored because most of the browsers don't implement them yet. So I always just pass them all to those first two. And then we give it the URL that we want to update to. So in this case, we're updating the address bar to say index.html or whatever the new page was. <clears throat> and then in, there are other cases, specifically with the login.html page, which I want to consider in some cases to be an interstitial. And what that means is um, that page will show if you try to navigate to a page that you need to be logged in at and you're not yet logged in. That page will show, um, but once you have finished your login, then we want it to go away and not be in the backward forward history because there's no reason for them to ever go back to the login page. That's a cool piece of functionality that we never had the ability to really do reliably. Now we can using replace state. So you can see that call there made on uh, line 83. All right, there's one last piece um, to using the history API. Oh, you can see here that I uh, 
I navigated to the login page, I logged in, it took me back to the home page, and instead of having three entries in the browser history for we puzzle it, I only have two because it considers the, the first view of the home page and the second view of the home page. And the login.html, which was there, has been replaced. The last piece of functionality that we want from the history API is if somebody uses a bookmark or pastes in a URL that has a different URL in it and we want to respond to that directly inside of our app instead of it treating it like a, uh, a full page load. This is also how we listen to the backward forward because that's the same action as far as the browser is concerned. If the URL changes outside of our app, not in our control, we want to listen for that so we listen for the state change event and then we simply call the appropriate go to page call in, in relation to that. That gives us a much more sensible use of backward and forward in the address bar and it makes it look like a normal web application or web page navigation even though under the scenes we're doing a lot more complicated things. Moving on, getting even deeper into um, JavaScript, we're going to talk about WebSockets. Uh, what a WebSocket is is a persistent connection between the user's browser and a server. This is different from a normal connection that a user makes when their browser requests a CSS file. It makes a connection and it keeps that connection open for maybe a couple of seconds beyond uh, the time that it received the response using something like Keep Alive. It maybe keeps it open for a little while, but it, it basically will shut down that connection once it's done with that, which means every time you need to communicate, every time we make an AJAX call, for instance, a new connection must be reestablished. Sockets are different, they're persistent, they stay around until you tell them not to or until something interferes and cuts off the connection. So in the case of a web socket, we need to establish a connection. Um, examples of things like that are like chat applications or in this case a game that's keeping uh, live updates of what's happening with the game, um, maybe even web or video conference and things like that where you have a continuous stream of data between the web server and the web browser and you need to keep open a persistent communication stream. The other thing that distinguishes this from AJAX is that this is a two-way channel. So both the browser can send data to the server and the server can send data to the browser and they can both respond or listen to those events. So it's a full duplex two-way communication between the browser and the server. That allows a server, for instance, to push out an update, which we'll see in the gameplay later, um, when somebody else in the game does something and you want to tell all the other people that are connected that it had happened, like they moved a piece, um, we push out an event, we do what's called a broadcast, and we say all connected clients need to get this message that pushes the message up through all connected sockets and they all get it simultaneously. So in this case, um, I have just one usage. I actually use sockets pretty significantly throughout the app, and you're welcome to take a look more in depth at the code on the GitHub repo. Uh, but if we take a look here, this is one example of how I'm using. Um, this is the initial connection when you come to the page and it doesn't have a session established. Um, it goes ahead and checks for that session ID, and then it establishes a socket connection for you. I'm using a library called Socket.io or Socket.io. Uh, I mentioned this to my workshop earlier, but I'll mention to the audience here in the webcast. Socket.io is a, both a browser and server implementation of the WebSocket protocol, along with an additional API that makes it really easy and useful to use. And thrown in, they have fallbacks for browsers that don't have true full WebSocket support. So they've got a variety of fallbacks like Flash fallbacks, and long-lived AJAX, long polling, and other things like that. So you can actually drop in socket.io into your browser and use it on the server and almost forget about the fact that there's a persistent set of really complicated connections going on. And uh, you're simply listening for events. So you can see on line 825, I say socket.on and I want to listen for the disconnect event. And that's exactly like listening for a click event that you might be used to. I listen for that event and then I respond to that appropriately. You can have both uh, well-defined, already predefined events, like disconnect is already a predefined event, and you can also listen to custom events, and I make heavy use of custom events. I think in the next slide we'll see that. Oh, it's one more slide. Okay, so um, 
here we can see that I'm, I'm doing socket.on to listen to on, and then when I want to send a message along the socket, I do socket.emit on line 868. So this, in this case, this is me saying, I want to go ahead and ask the server to validate the session. So I'm firing off the first request down the socket, telling the server validate this session, and then I'm listening for one of several messages that may come back, one of which might be a new session. Here you can see a bunch of custom game-related um, socket events that I'm listening for. That's socket.remove listeners. When you're done with that socket, you can remove that listener. Again, this is all pretty standard stuff if you're familiar with event handling. It looks similar to how you might do event handling with something like jQuery or one of those other JavaScript libraries, so it actually makes it pretty painless to use. <clears throat> The really nice part about Socket.io is that the API is almost entirely the same, both browser and server. When you're using something like Node.js or some other server-side JavaScript environment, Socket.io client looks exactly the same. So this is actually server-side code that we're looking at in slide 28. And um, you can see it looks very, very similar. We're calling .on to listen to an event and Socket.on and Socket.init. There's a couple of specific ones that are kind of server-only APIs that aren't present in the client. Um, in this case, on line 410, I'm doing socket.join. And I'm giving it, I just made up a name convention for a channel. This essentially allows you to parse out um, when you want to broadcast a set of messages. You may not want to broadcast it to all users, but only users that are actually in a certain channel. In this case, I use channels to manage the different games. So if you're in game A, you're not going to get any messages for the users that are in game B. It keeps the traffic down. So um, using channel filtering, we do that. And then on line 400, you see a dot of call, where I'm actually using an another form of message um, segregation. And in this case, it's uh, namespacing. So I have two different connections that are established between the browser's server, the browser and the server. Um, one of them is for the main site, and another one, which we'll see in a moment, is inside of a web worker that handles all of the main gameplay actions. So I actually have two socket connections, and I have them uh, parsed out into their different namespaces. So www for the web worker and site for the main site. Again, here's an example, socket.on, and then you can see io.o site when I want to message something out to the site part of the socket. So I know that I've got two connections for every single user if they're in the game, and I can simultaneously decide which, which one of those two namespaces I want to send messages out of. All right, the next API that we're going to talk about is actually very similar to WebSockets. Uh, the APIs look very similar. Um, and in fact, you can put a wrapper around it and make it look exactly the same if you wanted to. This is the use of web workers. Uh, what web workers mean is a, a separate and completely, at least mostly, parallel JavaScript execution environment um, from your main browser thread. So um, some of you may be aware of the limitations in a browser when you um, need to do more than one thing at a time. The browser only has a single thread of execution for JavaScript, and so you may have an event, two events that fire at the same time, and the second one ends up having to wait for the first one to finish. Well, that single thread of JavaScript execution, I would say, is probably um, sufficient for maybe 98% of all JavaScript that happens on the web. But there are a couple of different kinds of things that we need to do where we want it to run separate and not block the page. One reason we might want to prevent it from blocking the page and have it run in its own thread is if we have a long-running operation, say a mathematical calculation or something like that, and we don't want it to slow down our CSS animations, for instance. When we force the JavaScript into a web worker, it's in its own sandbox, it's in a different thread, and we make sure that there's no slowdown between the two. It's, it, as long as the person's device is capable of that second thread, then it runs it as a totally separate parallel thread. The way JavaScript manages the communication between those is using an asynchronous message, messaging API, a two-way API, that looks exactly like or very, very similar to the WebSocket API. That's why I said they're very similar. Um, you have an on message event that you listen for an event, and you post message when you want to send an event. And it's a two-way communication channel, just like you would normally see. 
when a worker posts a message, it sort of asynchronously just throws that message over the fence and says, hey, browser thread, whenever you're ready, listen to this event. So even if the browser thread maybe was doing something really complicated like an animation, it would just simply wait to process that message until it got if the, the worker would be unblocked and you'd be able to continue going. The same would be true of the browser. If the browser fired off a message to the worker and said, I'm just going to throw it over the fence, and whenever that worker is done with his really long-running mathematical calculation, then he can respond to that event. So you see here on line 295, uh, we're on slide 30, line 295, we have the on message event handler. We're listening for these various types of events. These are all custom events that I defined overview and tiles and freeze game. And, uh, and then when we want to emit events, we'll see on slide 31 that we can do uh, worker.post message and post that message. I'm actually going to go back uh, for just a moment to uh, to slide 31. Oh, sorry, I went too far. Never mind, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Okay, uh, moving on, we're going to be on slide 32. Now we're actually inside of a web worker. Um, so this is a separate file that we load. In this case, the, the, I call the file www.js for webworker.js. So you can see we start treating it like it's a global JavaScript file. This is a completely separate sandbox from the main page, so it's perfectly safe to declare our variables here. We have a new function that isn't available to normal JavaScript. It's called import scripts. That's how we can import other JavaScript into our namespace, essentially doing a synchronous JavaScript loading. And, uh, and in this case, we're loading up the socket IO client so we can use it inside of the web worker. Next slide, slide 33. You can see that inside of here, we have the exact same concept of how we create workers um, as when we create a web socket. We, on line 294, uh, to create that worker in www.js, we simply call new worker. That will load that file into a separate thread and establish the communication between the two. So it's very easy to do. Uh, slide 34, um, we're inside of the web worker, so the slides that must have gotten out of, out of uh, order there. Sorry about that. Inside um, 34, we're back inside of www.js, and this is how we listen. We call self.onmessage. That will listen for events. In this case, I call the start event and take tile and so forth. Finally, um, not all browsers support web workers, and we've mentioned several other um, of our APIs that we talked about that had various different uh, polyfills that allowed you to kind of uh, smooth over if something's missing. There are polyfills. There are um, sort of workarounds or fallbacks for browsers that don't have web workers. They're not actually um, capable of creating the full asynchronous non-blocking behavior, but you can get the same API so that your code doesn't have to change. It's just simply in that browser, the code would not be able to run purely in parallel and there would be some possible blocking effects. In this case, I actually wrote my own simple one. This is part of the code you can see here. This is me defining if worker doesn't already exist, I'm going to go ahead and define a little fallback and I simply create a post message and an on message set of handlers and emulate that API. It's very straightforward. There are better ones than the one that I wrote. This is very simple and straightforward for my purposes, but there are polyfills if you want to use web, web workers. Um, our last API that we're going to talk about um, as we're kind of winding down, I'm sure that you guys are, um, are quite inundated by all this code. I told you, I warned you that there would be a lot of code today. So go back and look at the GitHub repo later and, and try to digest some of this stuff. But the last one we want to talk about is the ability for JavaScript to communicate with local files. Uh, JavaScript actually has always had the ability to communicate with local files using the file input selector. But we couldn't actually do much with the file reference. In fact, the only thing we could do is have it in a form and post it up to the web server. Um, we weren't really able to inspect that file or know much about its file name or file contents. We certainly weren't able to actually read the contents directly. And surprise, now we can. So we actually have the ability completely in JavaScript to read a local file. Um, the user still has to initiate the action. 
using one of a couple of different events. You still have to say, I want you to open this file, so you don't have to worry that somebody can go and just read you know, malicious files. There's still security around it. But once a user has specifically chosen to pick a file and say, I want you to read it, they're able to do so. So in our game, we use this for the user to upload their image to start a new game. So in this case, you can see on line 708, I've got a reference to my file selector. This is a standard input type equals file. That's a reference to that element, and I'm listening for the change event. So I'm listening for when somebody selects a file using that element. When they do, I know that the, this callback will have on line 709, will have a files attribute on the this property. That files attribute will literally be an array of one or more files that the user selected from the browser select dialog. Um, as a side note, you can actually do file access using drag and drop, so users can drag a file from their desktop and drop it onto your web page, and you can get the reference to the files attribute the exact same way <laughs> as we did here. I'm not showing that here in the code because it's a bit more complicated, but you are able to do that. In any case, once we have a reference to the file, and in our game, we're only going to use the first one, but we make sure we have a reference to it. And you'll notice on line 714, the first thing I start doing is looking at stuff that I wouldn't normally be able to look at, like it's mime type. And I'm asking, is it of a type, a recognized mime type of image on line 14? So I want to make sure that you're not going to upload like a Word document with a malicious, you know, macro or something like that. So I'm looking at that type of the recognized image. Then down on line 17, I do yet another thing. I look at its file size. That was something capable of looking at before. Um, there's a little note there in the comments that there's differences between the browsers on what the property is called, but it's easy to work around. Once I've checked that it's the right image type and it's of the right size, not too big, not too small, then I call line one a function that I've defined called lead file, and I pass it a reference to that file element. So on the next slide, we'll take a look at how read file actually does the magic. Given a reference to a file, again, either from a file selector or from a drag and drop event, I can instantiate on line 477 a file reader object. That file reader object will do as it sounds, lo load the contents from a local file into a JavaScript object and let you do something with that contents. This, like most things, is an asynchronous API. So on line 493, that's where we actually tell it, go ahead and read it, and in fact, read it and tell, give me the contents helpfully formatted as a data URL. Why? Because I want to go ahead and stuff it directly into an image element so the user can see it. And data URLs are that helpful, uh, friendly format for that. There's other ways you can read it's binary and other things like that too, but in this case I'm reading this data URL. And I simply have an onload listener that says, when you finish reading that file, just give me the contents. And you can see that on line 489, event.target.result will actually be the data URL contents that I wanted. And then I have the type, so I know that it's a, you know, a type image JPEG or whatever. This looks, uh, you know, very similar. We have pop open our open dialog and we select an image using choose file. That's how we do that in the game. I don't have the, the drag and drop, but it's fully easy to do. All right, so now we finally are going to, uh, to turn on the game. So this particular URL, I'm going to go ahead and um, start up the server. So give me just a moment while I start up the server. My terminal died. One second. Good password. It takes me a moment to type it. Sorry. Okay. All right. The server has started now. Which, if you are um, on the line or here in person, and you're going to this address, the hpi.geti.fi, you're able to connect to the site. You'll know that it'll say connected. If it says disconnected, just try to refresh until it connects for you. Um, so. Again, it should be pretty self-explanatory the way this game works, and I'm sure now you're not going to actually listen to anything I say and you're going to start playing around with the game. 
um, but you're able to go in, just choose a login, type in a name and email. I don't store any of this stuff. It's just kept in memory until I restart the server. But um, you can log into the game. You can choose to play it. You can upload your own images and, uh, and have fun with it. I, I will note that I will keep the server up here for a little while. I'll monitor in case, you know, there's bugs and a crash or something. I'll keep the server up for a little while. Um, it's not a continuously up server at the moment while this is all in development. Um, so if you come back tomorrow, it's probably not going to be up, but uh, you can play with it for now. And uh, eventually this will be a fully polished game. Again, I'll put in a plug. If anybody wants to help design it and make it look cool, that'd be awesome. All right, well, that's it for um, the code part. Just want to remind you guys the HTML5 cookbook. It is on sale 50% off right now, uh, so go get that. There's uh, Twitter codes, I'm sure we'll be putting those out in the chat. And we've got about seven or eight minutes, it looks like, for some questions. So I'll wait to see in my chat if I get any questions. Um, and if I get any in person here, I will, from my uh, workshop, I'll make sure to relay them to the group. Hi, Kyle. We have quite a few questions in the queue if you want to take some of these. I'm, surprised. I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised at all. There's quite a few questions. <laughs> Um, would you like me to pick some out for you, or yeah, yes, do you want please. to take them? All right, so yeah, no. all right, let me give you a little uh, context for these. So let's see. When you were talking about app cache, Dom asks, are there any model view controller type frameworks becoming popular in the HTML5 community? Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of um, model view controllers that have been implemented in JavaScript. A couple that come to mind are JavaScript MVC um, by Jupyter21 guys, and, um, and uh, there's some others out there that are associated with even bigger UI frameworks and things like that. There's Backbone um, as another MVC framework. So there's several popular ones that are sort of in the JavaScript world. I don't know of any specifically that would that you'd put the HTML5 label on, but there are quite a few JavaScript MVC. My own personal opinion is that most of the time that's kind of overkill, um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff out there. So check out Backbone, check out JavaScript MVC, and there's probably you know a dozen or two dozen more that I'm forgetting that people are going to be mad at me for not knowing. Okay, and then way back at the beginning, uh, Diego asked what uh, text editor you were using. Was it Sublime? Yeah, that sure. screenshot was coming from Sublime. Okay, there are a lot of questions about I'm a, that. I'm a big factor. Of, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of that particular text editor. Okay, now I'm just going to run through these quickly, and okay. uh, as I warned you in advance, I'm not always sure what they mean, so bear with me. So here was a question. Um, it was asking if the selection dollar sign, um, boy, dollar sign parentheses quotation mark canvas in um, uh -huh. Is that the same as dollar sign parentheses um, uh, pound mark canvas? Okay, so that that question's a little bit more toward the usage of jQuery. Um, okay. When I do dollar sign quotes and I give it an HTML element that is with angle brackets, what I'm telling jQuery is I want you to create an element of that tag name type. So when I did angle bracket canvas and then the slash and close angle bracket, I was telling jQuery, create me a canvas element in, L in memory that I will then append to the page, which is very similar to if I just had that canvas element already in my markup, but I was doing so dynamically. The difference between that usage and using jQuery to select elements as opposed to creating them is when you give it a CSS style selector like a dot class or a pound ID, that's selecting one that's already in the DOM and giving me a reference to that. So that's the difference. When you, ang when you see the angle bracket, that um, almost always means that you are creating that element in memory. Good question. Okay. All right. And then Thomas asked, in your HTML you have a, a div class that equals nav. And he said, was this a conscious decision not to use the nav element? That's when you were talking about app cache. That's, that's a good question. So here in my workshop, we talked earlier about, um, about the difference between using div class with a, a semantic name versus using a semantic element. In this particular case, there wasn't a lot of conscious effort, um, but I do want to, I'll just, I'll just caution the audience here in the same that I did for the workshop, that in my opinion, 
um, there are some ugly parts where using semantics creates problems where, say, you want to nest one semantic element inside of another because that's the way your brain thinks about it, but all of a sudden now that's not uh, a valid way to nest those two elements. When you run into problems like that, in my opinion, it means don't, don't do the semantic element, just use a class name uh, with a semantic name. In most cases, something, you know, like nav, it would have been just fine. Um, so there wasn't a real conscious effort here, but just be aware of that. Okay. All right. And then um, let me see. When you were talking about uh, session storage, um, v Vitali, I can't pronounce that name, said session, session, <laughs> stumbly, session storage is only for the current tab. What if a user opens another window via control N? Most browsers will treat a new tab as a new session. Okay. So what he's saying is the, the session storage is only for that existing tab. All right. In, in most cases, that would be true, yes. Okay. And then Daniel asked, um, could you uh, talk about security considerations using the storage method, methods you were referring to? Okay. Good question. Um, so the browser applies a security model that's very familiar to the rest of us in terms of same domain and same host and same port. And in the same way that it restricts cross-domain AJAX calls, um, it restricts cross-domain local storage. As a matter of fact, there's no way for a, an application that's not on the domain to be able to access data that was stored on that domain. So in my particular case, we're storing data, session data and local storage data on the test.getify.com domain. No other domain, including getify.com, can access that data. Only pages that are on test.getify.com can access that data. So um, it's pretty secure in that respect. All righty. Let me, we get in a lot of questions. I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them. But um, Let me just remind everyone, if we don't get to your question, I am available via Twitter and email and all those other things. It's getify.me is that website. And I'm more than happy to answer questions. I've got to finish up, we'll be finishing up the workshop here, but I'll be fielding those questions uh, later today and then tomorrow and so forth. So if anyone has questions we don't get to, please feel free to reach out. Okay, good. Good. So um, let me go back to, uh, we'll take a couple more. Uh, Gabriel is asking, do WebSockets support UDP or only TCP? And also, can we use advanced stuff like UDP hole punching and the like? Good question. Probably a little bit over my head in terms of network, the underlying network stuff. As far as I know, uh, WebSockets use TCP connections only and they tunnel over HTTP. So I don't think they use UDP. I think some of the peer-to-peer -peer protocols, uh, you know, and, and the sending of like video data and you know, some really bleeding edge stuff, I think they're using UDP. But I'm almost positive that WebSockets tunnel over HTTP and TCP IP sockets. All right. And then Ken is asking, um, you were talking about client uh, side, but he wants to know what, um, what server-side support application servers support WebSockets? Okay, great question. Um, uh, there are, in almost every language you can think of, there are libraries for WebSocket support. Socket.io is the library that I happen to use. There's a bunch of others that you can use, and, and people are very religious about why they like one versus the other. Um, and each one of those are ported to a variety of different ones. I know for a fact that Socket.io has been ported to Java. I think there's a .NET port and some other ones. So um, there's broad, wide-based support for sockets from the server in almost any language that you choose. Okay. All right. And let's see. Um, Thomas has a good question. He said, the one thing that puts him off developing games in JavaScript is that it's so easy for someone else to copy your game code and reskin it. And he wants to know, is there any way that you can protect your work from being easily stolen and redistributed? Uh, don't put it on GitHub <laughs> like I did. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 you can't protect somebody from not seeing your JavaScript, and any attempt to do so is a foolhardy attempt. You can try to minify and obfuscate your code, and some people do that. Uh, there's lots of tools that undo that stuff. So I think it's a foolhardy attempt to protect your JavaScript on the client side. Of course, what you have running on the server side which in the case of a game is going to be almost all of your 
real intellectual property anyway. Uh, you don't have to publish that code like I did. Um, you know, I, I published my server.js file. And you can see exactly how it runs on both sides. But in most cases, if you're writing a game and you're writing the proprietary logic, the game logic on the server, you want all the important game logic anyway on the server because you don't want people to be able to cheat. Um, so you want to enforce all the state management, all that stuff on the server. That's where your real intellectual property is, and that's server code. And for the most part, that's pretty well protected unless, of course, you get hacked. So um, I, I encourage people, you know, I, gaming is not for everybody. I happen to think that this particular game gave us an opportunity to touch across a bunch of different APIs all in one thing, and, and that makes it more useful and practical, I think. Um, but all these things can be used outside of the world of gaming. So if gaming isn't your thing, you know, find something else. Okay. Well, you know what? We're running over time, and, and these questions are fascinating, and, but I think we'd better wrap it up. And um, right. they just keep coming in. I know you have people there, and I don't want to intrude on your time with them. But it was an awesome presentation, Kyle. Thank you guys very yeah. much. This was an honor. I hope... Uh, like I said at the outset, I hope that we do nothing but just inspire you to go out, start experimenting with this stuff. There, I'm fascinated by these. Now, just know your audio is uh, cutting out a little bit. I don't know why, but it might uh, be everyone saying thank you. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, I hope we're inspired. I hope you're inspired to go out and play around with this stuff and reach out if you have any questions. All right, it was great. So to reach out uh, on Twitter at Getify. And um, you, they can go to your site, httpgitify.me, and you have all your information there. So um, everyone, just check that out. And, uh, okay, questions on Twitter. Thanks so much. And, folks, we'll have the recording available in about um, probably by the end of the week. We're running a little bit behind because we have people out. But uh, we'll get it up as soon as we can and email everyone. If you want a copy of the chat transcript, Go ahead and email me at webcast at O'Reilly.com, and I can send it to you as a text uh, attachment. <laughs> and um, it's a lot to wade through, but that's a good way to get it. And that's about it. So I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Gretchen. Hey, and, are yes? we Are we putting out that uh, – can we put out that discount code in the chat so that uh, anybody who's trying to buy the book can get it at 50% uh, off? All right, so there's no code needed today if you if you buy it um, through our deal of the day. Just go to the book page and uh, purchase it. It's 50% off the ebook. We also have a great code that you can use um, just about any time. The code is forecast, and it will give you 40% off print books and 50% off ebooks when you purchase them on O'Reilly.com. And the great thing about that is it helps support our free webcast program. So it's the numeral four. Let me type that in there. I know Gretchen's, oh, Gretchen's doing it. And there we go. So please use that and sh share it with your friends. Don't don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> okay. All right. That's about it. Thanks, so everyone. thank you, Appreciate everyone. Thanks, Kyle. Bye-bye.